Step into a world shrouded in mystery and intrigue as we delve into the untold stories of professional wrestlers whose lives were tragically cut short. In this captivating narrative, we navigate the chilling accounts of wrestling legends who met their end under haunting circumstances. Through meticulous research, in-depth investigations and expert insights, we unravel the enigmatic web surrounding these shocking murders that sent shockwaves through the wrestling community. Join us on this gripping journey as we piece together the facts, examine the motives, and remember the lives that were lost too soon. Join us as we embark on this dark voyage into the underbelly of the wrestling world and uncover the chilling truths that lie beneath the surface. These are the professional wrestlers that were murdered. Warning, this episode contains content that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Alberto Perez Jimenez and his twin brother Alejandro were established athletes in AAA in Mexico, where they competed under the ring names La Parquita and Espectrito II, respectively. What was notable about these two wrestlers is that they were midgets, both being billed as 4 feet 7 inches. Despite their short height, they even managed to make it to the WWF, and they had a pretty successful wrestling career. But it was all cut short in 2009, when the twin brothers were found murdered. It was reported that the two brothers checked into a hotel after a Sunday night show. Allegedly, two female prostitutes approached the wrestlers and were invited back to their hotel room. In the hotel room, the two women spiked the men's drink with what was believed to be eye drops mixed with the alcohol. When the two brothers passed out, the two women robbed them of their wallets and cell phones. The twins died from the drugs added to their drinks. Usually this procedure did not kill the victims of the women, but the size of the victims played a part in their death. The two women were eventually arrested and were sentenced to 47 years in prison for the murder of the twins. Dino Bravo started his career in Montreal, Canada in the 1970s and he became one of the top professional wrestling stars of Canada, winning several major Canadian titles. He eventually signed for the WWWF, now WWE, and he won the WWWF World Tag Team Championship and he's also the sole holder of the WWF Canadian Championship before the title was abandoned in 1986. He retired in the early 90s and he started winding down his career. He began training wrestlers in Montreal, Canada. Rumors later emerged that he was involved in the illegal business of cigarette smuggling. After the mafia took notice, Bravo was shot dead in his home in 1993 at the age of 44. He was hit by 11 bullets in the head and torso. In an interview, his former opponent Brett the Hitman Hart revealed that Bravo confided to his friend shortly before his death that he knew his days were numbered. Bravo's murder is still unsolved to this day. Gentleman Chris Adams had a successful wrestling career. He's also the man who trained Stone Cold Steve Austin. And through the course of his 23 year professional wrestling career, he held a total of 26 titles. He's also the man who is responsible for popularizing the super kick as a finisher, which was subsequently employed by a lot of other performers. In April of 2000, though, Adams and his girlfriend of four months were both found unconscious inside a friend's apartment. They had both overdosed on the drug GHB and alcohol. Adams recovered, but 10 hours later, his girlfriend died at a local hospital. Because of all of this, Adams was charged for manslaughter. He waited to find out whether or not the court would find him guilty, but he never lived to hear the verdict. As just a year after the death of his girlfriend, he was shot in the chest during a drunken brawl with a friend at his home in Texas. He was 46 years old. Self-defense was claimed and the gun owner was acquitted of all charges. Following his death, Stone Cold Steve Austin stated, I'm sorry he got killed but the guy did not have good karma. The Irish Ironman Shane Shamrock spent the majority of his career in Maryland Championship Wrestling MCW, where he held the MCW Light Heavyweight Championship until the time of his death. Shamrock died at the age of 23 after being fatally shot by police during an altercation at his home in Maryland. Officers were responding to a 911 call from his girlfriend after Shamrock allegedly threatened to stab her with a kitchen knife. He was then shot and killed by responding officers after refusing to drop the weapon. He was posthumously named the Lifetime MCW Light Heavyweight Champion with the organization retiring the title a month after his death. Ricky Lawless was considered to be an excellent technician during his career in the 80s. He trained a lot of independent wrestlers such as Joey Maggs, Bobby Starr and Axel Rotten. However, in 1988, Lawless was shot in his Maryland home. 
was determined by police that the man that killed Lawless was the husband of a woman that Lawless had been reportedly having an affair with. At the time of his murder, he was still the reigning heavyweight champion for Star Cavalcade Wrestling. The title was declared vacant immediately afterwards and won by his former student, Axel Rotten. The father of Puro Resu, Ricky Dozen, was originally a sumo wrestler, but he went on to become one of, if not the greatest grapplers in the history of Japanese wrestling. Many people credit him as the man behind the rise of professional wrestling in Japan. There's no other man who had an impact on Japanese wrestling as much as Ricky Dozan. Unfortunately, Ricky Dozan was involved in a drunken spat with a Yakuza member at a nightclub, which ended up with him getting stabbed. Luckily, this wound was declared non-fatal, but he still went and got surgery on it. But as soon as he got home from the surgery, he started drinking alcohol immediately, which caused his condition to deteriorate and he died just one week later of an infection to his wound. He was 39 years old. Tank Morgan was a professional wrestler that was born in 1933 and his name died down following his tenure in the WWWF, now WWE, between 1966 and 1967. But in 1966, he lost to former WWE champion Bruno San Martino in a 2 out of 3 falls match which took place inside the world's most famous arena, Madison Square Garden. This was the most notable moment in Morgan's entire career, but sadly he was gunned down in a drive-by shooting in 1991 whilst walking his dog. The details concerning his death are comparatively scarce. Many people believe that Tang Morgan was caught up in the crossfire and was a victim of mistaken identity. What we do know though is that he was murdered in cold blood. Iron Mike Steele was a wrestler who wrestled across many independent promotions and he made frequent appearances on Pro Wrestling Weekly. Steele took part in several matchups with notable names in the 90s including Mark Merrow and Dean Malenko. Unfortunately, his wrestling career and life came to an end in 2007. Steele refused to fight a belligerent drunk man at a bar and he walked out of the bar and left on his Harley Davidson motorcycle. The man followed him in his work van and rammed Steele's motorcycle, killing him in the process. The killer was charged with murder and sentenced to life without parole. The Iron Mike Foundation was started in his name to raise money for children's charity. Neil Superior was trained by WWE Hall of Famer Afa Anoa'i in All-Star Wrestling League. Superior competed in the Indies before opening his own wrestling schools, and he died in 1996. Neil Superior left his hotel room around 4 a.m. on August 23, 1996 and he was observed acting erratically and running around naked on the 7th floor of his hotel. He was also jumping around and banging his head against the wall. Police were called and the officers responded but they were unable to bring him under control as they engaged in a foot chase of him. According to eyewitnesses, the cops put what resembled to be a dog collar around Superior's neck until he later became unconscious. They later discovered that he wasn't breathing. After his death, it was found out that he had been diagnosed with a medical condition two years earlier, a neurological problem possibly resulting from a wrestling-related injury that caused seizures and made him appear to be sleepwalking. After this incident, Neil's family filed a federal lawsuit alleging police brutality, but the case was ultimately dismissed. Bruiser Brody was a legend of his time, a 6'8 bearded mountain of a man. He would enter the ring like a hurricane of fury and rage, and with fur-covered boots swinging a chain. Audience members would run in fear from the huge man. Brody was considered as one of the best and brightest stars of the 80s. He was a popular name across the world, most notably in Japan. He was truly one of the greatest heels of the 20th century. Brody would do tours around the world, and when Brody wrestled a man by the name of Jose Gonzalez, known by his ring name Invader 1, Brody worked a little bit too stiff and he beat the crap out of this dude, essentially burying him in the eyes of the fans. While Gonzalez was in the hospital after the Bruiser Brody match, he was noted as saying, one day I'm gonna kill that man. And in 1988, when Brody was in the locker room before his scheduled match in Puerto Rico, Jose Gonzalez allegedly asked him to step into the shower area to discuss business. There was an argument between the two wrestlers and a scuffle ensued. Due to the dressing room layout, there were no witnesses of the altercations. However, two screams were heard, loud enough for the entire locker room to hear. Tony Atlas ran into the shower and saw Brody bent over holding his stomach. Atlas then looked up at Gonzalez and saw him holding a bloody knife. Due to the heavy traffic outdoors and large crowd in the stadium, it took paramedics almost an hour to reach Brody. When paramedics arrived, 
Atlas helped carry Brody downstairs to the waiting ambulance, as due to Brody's size, paramedics were unable to lift him. He later died from stab wounds. Gonzalez claimed self-defense and testified in his own defense. He was acquitted of the murder in 1989. The prosecution witnesses living out of Puerto Rico did not show up, claiming that they had not received their summons until the trial had ended. So essentially, Jose Gonzalez got away with killing a man. Rest in peace to all the wrestlers on this list. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other videos. Also, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. But anyway, goodbye.